Let's talk to Daniel Hannon, though, to find out what he makes of it all. Daniel, very good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Mike. Nice to join you. Yeah, nice to speak to you again. We haven't spoken for a while. I mean, I must find myself agreeing with Douglas Murray today, saying uh, in his piece in The Sun that basically... um, The EU is the problem here. It's not that Boris Johnson um, is trying to appease everybody else. Uh, It's not that Boris Johnson is trying to make sure he keeps his backbenchers happy at the same time uh, as making sure he gets a deal of some kind. You know, the EU could have made this easier, couldn't they? I think that point would be obvious to everyone if it weren't for the fact that there is a group of people in Britain who were so kind of embittered after the referendum that they are now determined to blame everything on Britain and never blame the EU. Mm. I think if you're looking at it as a neutral, you just have to look at how the talks have unfolded. Remember that Theresa May tried to get a much closer deal, which would have uh, given Brussels much of what it's now uh, claiming is so important in terms of following their laws, uh, copying all of their rules on the environment and labour standards and so on. And they threw that back in her face. Uh, the, the Salzburg summit, they said absolutely not. And, and Michel Barnier had this chart, you'll remember having seen it, Mike. Mm. It was like a, a staircase. And it said, you know, if you don't want to be in the single market, then your only option is a Canada deal. Right. And of course, when the moment that Boris said, OK, thank you very much, then I'll have that, it was suddenly snatched away. No, 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 we can't have a Canada deal because you're too close and you're too big. And you, we, we, and do you know what? I, I actually don't think this is about trade, right? Mm. We, we, we've been doing trade deals around the place with very few problems, and so is the EU. Uh, And in none of them does this issue arise of we want continuing supervision of your standards in perpetuity, let alone we want to plunder some of your resources. I think the reason that the EU is treating Britain very differently from the way it's treated Japan or Canada or Korea or any other country that it's done trade deals with is because deep down it is struggling to let go. It's still the imperial power trying to deal with a renegade province and trying to assert some kind of continuing suzerainty or sovereignty mm. or control so that we, so that they don't have to face the fact that we've, we've truly become an independent country. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's an ideological chasm now which can never really be breached. I was listening to an interview uh, with the deputy leader of the European Union, uh, Heidi somebody or other, who's a green M- MEP from uh, from Germany. And she was saying, you know, this whole idea of, of Britain on the global stage is outdated, it's outmoded, it's not something that they should be trying to do because everybody now knows that cooperation and big organisations is the future. Well, I'm sorry. Actually, the people of this country decided that was not the future. Uh, and as I've often and said to people, who knows how much bigger the EU would have tried to get if we hadn't left? Yeah, I mean, I think that's very telling. I mean, first, first of all, I think that's wrong, right? If, if being part of a big block were necessary uh, for your prosperity, then China would be richer than Hong Kong mm. and Indonesia would be richer than Singapore. Uh, and for that matter, the EU would be richer than Switzerland, right? Yeah. So it, 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 what, what matters is getting your tax and regulations right and, and so on. But in terms of, uh, uh, of what that reveals about the EU's attitude, I think it's very telling. Uh, what's bothering them is the idea of a wholly independent Britain sitting next to them as a sovereign country. And, you know, I mean, this can be difficult. I mean, to, 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 to be fair, I, th- I think Britain, you know, 100 years ago was going through a similar difficult process of psychological adjustment when Ireland became independent. Mm. And, and uh, following... Uh, the the war and, and Irish independence. The, the the British government at that time spent a lot of uh, of energy trying to kind of say, well, you've still got to swear an oath of allegiance to the crown, and we've still got to have some sort of token, you know, treaty yes. port, token fiscal trans. And it, it wasn't really that these things made any difference on the ground. It was that they were trying to salvage the idea that uh, you know there hadn't been a complete breakaway. And the EU is going through. It took us a generation, and the EU, I think, is going through a similar process. Of psychological adjustment. Yes, I think that's right, because it's interesting, isn't it, that you say it's not about individual trade, because it is almost as though they want us to have to ask for everything um, uh, so that, you know, we cannot make any independent conversations take place and we cannot really have any proper rights of our own. But do you worry that Boris Johnson is not going to go full pelt on this? And do you worry that that he will disappoint sort of Brexiteers who expect him to, to if he not, if he's not happy, walk away? No, I'm not in the least bit worried. I have absolute confidence in the position that Boris has staked out, and I know he'll stick to it. And I wouldn't overstate this, but I I know enough of David Frost's views, our chief negotiator, uh, to know that his 
fundamental assumptions and objectives going into this are the right ones. I mean, at least from from my perspective. Yes. So, you know, what's going to happen, whether there's a deal or not, whatever the, the news is 48 hours from now, everyone is going to be pronouncing before they've had a chance to read it or digest what has happened. Uh, and, and that, you know, we, 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 we've both worked in the media. We know that that's, that's the dynamic. But I would just say in advance, I, I know enough of the, the people involved, enough of Boris and of the negotiating team to trust them to have come to the right judgment. If they choose to walk away, it will be for a good reason. If they decide on balance to sign a deal, again, that will be for a good reason. Yeah, and as you've said earlier, I think the whole point of, of all of this is that this time next year we'll be standing here or sitting here having a similar conversation uh, without an awful lot really having changed. We will have left the European Union, but we won't be starving. You know, we won't be waiting for medicines that are stuck in Calais uh, because we somehow can't get them across the channel. You know, our lives will not be substantially altered effectively, as far as I'm concerned. But also there will always be a kind of continuous and an ongoing conversation with the EU about all manner of things, presumably. Yeah, well, I mean, you say that. I was actually thinking slightly whimsically the other day that <laughs> on one level, all of these Remainer predictions came true in the sense that, you know, we can't travel, you know, our GDP has taken a huge hit uh, and indeed there's been a plague of locusts. Um, yes. But I don't think any of those are because of Brexit. No, I mean, it, 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 it's, it, it's very striking to me how easily this could have been done had there been just a smidgen of goodwill. Mm. And the proof of that for me is the deal that we've got with Switzerland, where you know Switzerland is is largely in the single market. So doing the the, the deal we've done with Switzerland is is replicating most of what we were talking about with the EU. Yeah, you know it took us a few weeks to negotiate that because basically the Swiss and we sat down and said, "Are you happy to carry on? Yep. You happy to carry? Yep. Fine. You know that's a, a, and and starting as we were from a position of identical regulations, it should have been a fairly straightforward process. And indeed, the trade and economic bits have been very straightforward. Mm. But the, the the problem has come because the EU is making these extraneous demands that it doesn't make of any other country on issues like fisheries, supervision of our standards, and so on. And, and in the end, only they can decide whether they want a deal. But I, I would just make one more point, if I may, Mike, which is, yeah. you know, in this whole debate, this curious idea has been slipping in that somehow, you know, countries trade with one another out of kindness, you know, why should the EU give us mm. a trade deal unless we're prepared to give it? You know, I mean, do, do people really think that trade is an act of generosity? Of course it isn't. It, it's it's an act pursued for the enrichment of your own people, mm. your own consumers, uh, and the benefit of your own exchequer. And if the EU, in the end, wants to cut off its nose to spite its face, wants to pay an economic price, provided that we pay one as well, we can't stop them making that judgment. I hope that they will look uh, to what is the, the mutual benefit of both you know, sides of the channel. You know, we, we both have an interest in having rich neighbours and, and good trading partners and in maintaining the Western alliance. But in the end, that's their call rather than ours. Well, exactly right. But also their calls are not as universal as they would like to think that they are either. I mean, it's almost interesting to me, you were talking about uh, the Remainers and terrible warnings and all of that. All the people who say, you know, fishing is not really important to Britain. It's a very small part of our GDP. It's just a totemic kind of, you know, badge of honour for Boris Johnson to defend and it doesn't matter. Well, if it doesn't matter, why are the French and the Dutch uh, so worked up about how it turns out. It obviously does matter to them. And the idea that they can sort of come to us and say, you know, uh, we might give you back some of your own fishing rights uh, that you gave us a few dozen years ago, you know, it's laughable. And also the idea they're going to go to somehow uh, the French uh, champagne producers uh, as the EU and say, you must not sell any champagne to the UK unless you charge it up by another 50 percent or something. It's a nonsense, isn't it? Well, it, that is the, the second of those is, is certainly nonsense because it's up to us whether we charge tariffs on imports. And I think it would be a mistake uh, across the board to do that, whether you're looking at, at straight imports like that, buying champagne or whether it's uh, components for, for production lines here or whatever. I, I, you know, we, we, we don't need anyone's permission to lower our tariffs. And I, I believe we should be doing it across the board mm. and vis-a-vis -vis the whole world, including the EU. But on, on fisheries, I mean, you know, I think it's a really good point that you make. The, the, we want what every country in the world takes for granted, which is control of our own maritime resources. Every state in the world has sovereignty over its own marine resources. Now, having established that principle, we can afford to be quite generous about the terms 
and conditions of, of access. Because mm. frankly, after half a century in the common fisheries policy, nearly half a century, we don't have anything like the capacity to land all the fish that would now come within our waters. There right. isn't a major fishing port, you know, between uh, Peter's Head and Plymouth, right? So, so if we do a deal, we can be quite generous about quotas, about transitions, in a way that almost every other country allows foreign vessels into its waters, provided it's understood that that is their call, that, that, that it's their resources and they can kind of lease access to others. And if, if that doesn't happen, and this is what makes the, the French position so bewildering, if there is no deal, then instead of having a partial and phased reduction in their catch, not a, not a, a total exclusion, not a drop to zero, but some reduction in their catch, the French really would have a total exclusion from our waters tomorrow. Mm. Right? Uh, and the idea, therefore, that this is really about the, the, their fishermen is totally bogus. This is much more about teaching us a lesson, as they see it. Yes. Uh, as Michel Barnier said at the beginning, you know, I'm going to have to school the British in, in what Brexit actually means. And, and I think there's that lingering resentment, which even now is making it very difficult for the EU to come to a deal. Yes, I mean, some of the things that were being said by this Heidi woman as well were, were rather amusing in as much as the, uh, the, the the advent of the Brexit Party MEPs who went over to Brussels and kind of refused to sing the, the Ode to Joy and turned their backs on all sorts of things. And, you know, she was bemoaning the fact that that was terribly rude um, and that actually, you know, they never really belonged there in the first place. And it's all very sort of cultish, it seems to me. I mean, you've spent time uh, in the European Parliament in Brussels when you were an MEP. I mean, it seems as though there's not a lot of room for dissent there. No, I mean, it was the, it, the the funny thing was, it's supposed to be a representative assembly, uh, and yet they hated it when it was at all representative. In other <laughs> words, when it admitted views that, that differed right. from theirs. On, on, I mean, it was, I suppose it was representative on sort of left-right issues, but it was obligatory to be in favour of a federal Europe. Yes. And, you know, I mean, it, had there been a little bit more flexibility on that at any point, you know, had David Cameron come back with any retrieval of power, as late as February 2016, I think he'd have probably won. Yeah. But what tipped the country into voting leave was this sense that even when faced with the loss of their second biggest member, the EU was still not prepared to concede any return of, of power to the national level. And I think there was a real sense in, in I, I can remember it very well, being on the campaign trail at that time, a lot of people were saying, well, hang on, if this is how they're treating us now before we've even voted, phew, how are they going to treat us if we vote to remain? Yes. Now, if that was why people voted leave, and I think that was a big issue for the people who were weighing it up until the last minute, they've been completely vindicated because since the referendum, rather than saying, oh, you know, maybe we, maybe we could have done this differently. Maybe we were a little bit too centralizing, too ambitious, too remote. Maybe, you know, maybe other countries will have similar concerns. Maybe we should try and address those. Maybe we should try and decentralize a little bit. On the contrary, the, the Eurocrats have said, oh, fabulous, the Brits have left, full steam ahead. Now we can have our European ta tax system and our European army and our Euro bonds and all the rest of it. So, you know, the, the EU is, if you like, doubling down on this political union and good luck to them, right? It's no longer gonna be our problem. We're not members anymore, we should wish them well. But it does explain why it was necessary for Britain, if it wanted to remain an independent sovereign country, to take a different route. And it also, I think, highlights the fact that they will be a much less potent force without Britain. And they will worry that other countries will watch what happens and may wish to follow uh, Britain's lead. And they may see perhaps the end of the great European federalist dream because suddenly, the, as you say, the, the, you know, the biggest contributor to it doesn't want any part of it. I mean, I, th I think that is, for some of them, they've said this openly, that is the worry about Brexit, that um, if, it, unless they make it as painful as possible, you know, the Dutch or the Danes or the Swedes or somebody else might want to follow. Mm. And that in itself is a very telling argument, isn't it? Because if the benefits of EU membership were so clear and obvious, as we're always being told in Brussels, then you wouldn't need to punish a country for leaving, right? Because leaving would be its own punishment. Yes, of course. And, and the attitude that they've had, you know, Michel Barnier, at the start of the talks, said to the other leaders, my job is to offer the Brits such a hard deal that they'll wish they voted to stay. Mm. And you, you think, you know, a, 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 a group of nations that has to threaten members to stop them leaving, but that's not a club, that's a protection racket. Yeah. And I wonder, actually, funnily enough, whether they won't fail in their own terms and prompt other people 
to start thinking about walking out simply because they've been so unreasonable. About yes, it. and they'll miss the money too, let's not forget. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, the, uh, every budget has been blown out of the water by the events <laughs> of the past 10 True. months. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're all... The, 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 the difference between the best and worst Brexit scenarios is suddenly trivial compared to what we're spending every week on these, uh, you know, quantitative easing and, mm. and the, the furlough scheme and all the rest of it. Uh, again, you'd think all the more reason why at a time like this you should try and maximize where you can the economic benefits of trade uh, and it is extraordinary i think to a lot of people and certainly to a lot of foreign observers that i've, I've been talking to uh, recently that the eu is still putting politics before economics and saying even if it makes us worse off even if we have to pay a price even if our people suffer you know higher unemployment and slower growth mm. we would still rather do that than have to watch a post-EU Britain succeed. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. Daniel, great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Daniel Hannan uh, talking to us there, Telegraph columnist, a visiting professor at the University of Buckingham, member of the UK Board of Trade as well. Uh, sounding very bullish, I would have to say, uh, on the prospects of Boris Johnson emerging from these talks in Brussels uh, as the victor, whether or not there is a deal, uh, whatever it is that is happening in Brussels, clearly is being uh, orchestrated by uh, the European Union, being orchestrated by Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, she is not somebody who wants to see Britain leaving the European Union. They would still, I'm sure, any, bet you any money uh, if Boris went over there and said, I'll tell you what, you know what, maybe we'll just stay. They would love that. They would absolutely love it. Uh, we, of course, would not absolutely love it. And that would be the death knell for Boris Johnson's prime ministership. But that ain't going to happen. But we will bring you, uh, of course, every development as it does happen when Boris Johnson does go to Brussels, which might be tomorrow afternoon. Uh, it may be Thursday. We shall see.